Well, good morning. What a joy to be able to uh, share in this beautiful day with this wonderful family by dedicating this child unto the Lord. I remember my wife was pregnant with our first child uh, just about eight years ago. And uh, yeah, you can, you can see. She looks good once again. <laughs> There's me. And I, I remember it was such an emotional time because you're, you know, you're going through so much and uh, wondering what is to come. So, so much nervousness, but so much excitement. And I remember my wife Sarah and I would have these long dialogues around what are we going to name our child? And we found out ahead of time that it was going to be a boy and just debating through all different kinds of names, scouring the internet because really a, a name is one of the first gifts that you can give to your child. And for us, we put a, a high uh, stakes on that. We really wanted the name to have some meaning. And so we ended up choosing the name William based off of the name of William Wilberforce, inspired by him and his work that he did as a politician uh, in Great Britain and uh, helping to abolish the slave trade there. We thought that that was amazing. And so our son is named after him. And, you know, I think about, I really deeply desire for my son to have a life of meaning and purpose. But what is a life that has meaning? What is a life of purpose? How do I make the most of my life? How do you make the most of your life? I want that for my son. I want that for myself. So how do you how do you have a life of meaning? Our American culture today has several answers to that question that we're going to explore. And Jesus has one that is actually very different. And my hope today is that it both encourages you and challenges you. So would you join me in prayer? Lord Jesus, I pray that you would speak to us through the power of your word. We believe that you are alive and active and well. So through the power of the Holy Spirit, would you not leave us the same today? In Jesus' name, and all who agree with their prayer said amen. So we are going to open up our Bibles to Mark chapter 10. It's going to be up on the screen there for you as well. And we pick it up where uh, two of Jesus' disciples are approaching Jesus and for a conversation. And later, the rest of the 12 disciples, the people closest to Jesus, his closest friends in his life, uh, are going to join him as well. This is in Mark chapter 10, verse number 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do? Jesus asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink? or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the 10 other disciples heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many." So the question we're asking today, how do I make the most of my life? Our American culture has several different answers, and we're going to take a look at three of them today. The first answer that I believe culture gives to us is the way that we can make the most of our lives is to use what I have to get more authority. To use what I have to get more authority so that I can have this authority so that I can be able to call the shots. You even see this right away in verse number 35. You've got the two disciples and they've seen Jesus perform all sorts of miracles by this point. And so what they start out by say is saying, Jesus, teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask. That's the posture they start with. I don't know about you, but 
I don't really feel like I'm much better than James and John, that there's times that's, that's how I'm starting my conversations with God. I want you, God, to do what I am asking. And, you know, because part of what it is for us, we really like to have authority. We really like to have control. And there's this, there's this hidden downfall that the culture doesn't always talk to us about, about using what I have just to get more authority. And that is that when you use what you have to get more authority, it can actually make you suspicious of others. Because you can actually start to think, are these people just trying to take my authority? Are they trying to usurp what is mine? Are they trying to take what I've earned, what is, what is rightfully mine? And then what ends up happening when you start operating like that is you start to push relationships away. So it's really challenging to have deep and meaningful friendships and relationships in your life. The culture doesn't teach us that. It just teaches us that use what you have to climb the ladder, to get to the top so that you can be in control. Because when you are in control, you get to help decide and determine what the outcomes are. And before we think that's just the world out there that lives like that, we've got to look inward at our own hearts. I recognized a conversation I was having with my wife this week, talking actually about my son and his education and, and some things. And the conversation we were having wasn't uh, to try to do something immoral or out of bounds or anything like that. But really what, what we both came to the senses of, of the conversation was we're really trying to control this thing right here. This isn't, this isn't a situation where we're really meant to be in control and we're trying to. We really felt convicted in that moment. And so that happened to me Thursday. So I think this happens to us regularly in our hearts and in our lives. But it's the message that our world says, if you want to live a life of meaning, that the way you do that is you accumulate more authority. The second way that I believe that our culture teaches us is to, to use what you have to get more wealth. And of course, money in and of itself is not evil, but money can very easily grip our hearts and become the thing that we pursue. And it's rarely for us that we're pursuing money for money's sake so we can just have this pile of money. It's what money can provide for us. And it's whatever that, that, that we want. So maybe it's uh, luxury, or maybe it's freedom, or, or opportunities, or we want people to look at us, we want people to respect us. If I use what I have to get more wealth, because money in our culture equals freedom, and freedom is our ultimate goal and ideal. But I think of the story that Jesus told of the rich young man. This is told in Luke chapter 12. It's a parable. And basically, these uh, two siblings are having this argument over an inheritance and who's going to get what. And Jesus says, I'm not the arbiter here. Like, who made me the judge of this? So he goes on to tell a story about this rich young man who had plenty. He already had these barns built up with plenty of grain um, stored up. And he said, you know what? Even though I already have plenty, tear that all down so that I can build even bigger barns so I can store up even more. And here's the hidden downfall that our culture doesn't talk about when I use what I have to get more money to try to live a life of purpose, is that money is really an illusion. What the story of the rich young man says is that Jesus says, you fool, this very night, your life is going to be demanded from you. In other words, you're going to pass away and it's all going to be gone. You're not going to, you don't get to take a dime with you after you pass away. And you've used all of your time, energy to just build up these storehouses. But that's not the message our culture sends. Our culture sends money is freedom. So use what you have to get more. It's a very different message than using what you have to be a good steward in your life. That's something I am personally deeply passionate about, is figuring out how you can steward the resources God has given you to help be a blessing in other people's lives. But there's a very different message than tear down, I'm already set, and build it even bigger. And that's the message of our culture, of how you live a life of meaning and the reason how you can have value in this world. The third thing that our culture teaches us is to use what I have to get more love. We want the most beautiful people to be around us. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an attractional thing that we can use in our lives. I mean, I even think I'm like, 
how did all the most attractive people find each other on Instagram? Do they just like, I don't know. Actually, I'm not really curious. So don't send to me if, if there is a way that they're doing that. But, you know, but it's like I can use what I have to try to get more love, to try to look more attractive or to get people to like me for what I have or what I can provide. Maybe it's not even looks. Maybe it's even that like I am really good at my job. And so people love me because of the service I can provide. But there's again a hidden downfall that doesn't get talked about. And what happens when that becomes the pursuit of your heart and of your life is that it actually results in insecurity. Even if you're the most beautiful person on the planet, it can result in insecurity because you're wondering, what if I didn't look so good? Or what if I wasn't so good at my job? Would these people still love me? Would they still respect me? And so we start to wonder, like, is this really worth it? But it's the ideal that our culture holds up for how you can live a life of meaning and purpose in our world. It's through authority. It's through the accumulation of wealth and through trying to get people to love you. But this is what's interesting about what Jesus says. He doesn't, he doesn't say any of those things is what results in a life of meaning. Jesus says that it results when we serve other people. And that's just the thing about Jesus. He's always flipping things upside down. That's how the kingdom of God works. Like we see things one way and he's like, no, 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 no. It's, it's totally different than how you've been taught and how you're thinking right now. Like we look at it as a hierarchy that there's like the top and the goal is to get to the top and then it trickles on down and the person down here has lesser value. The person up here has so much more value. And we wouldn't say that overtly, but we treat people that way in our lives. And what Jesus says, it's the total opposite. It's an inverse. Like the triangle has been flipped upside down. So the greatest is actually the least among us. He says this in verse 43 from what we read. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. For even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, the culture is always asking, how can you get more? And the kingdom is always asking, how could I give? How could I release? How could I serve? What do I have? What can I give? And so that's the question we're going to ask today is what do you and what do I have to serve with? If that's what Jesus says is the point and the purpose of how you live a meaningful, purposeful life, what do you and I have to give? The first thing that you and I have is our gifts. And I want you to recognize something. You have a unique gift mix that nobody else in the history of the world has ever had. Like God has uniquely wired you in the image of God with certain gifts, talents, and abilities to be able to be used for the benefit of others. And here's the thing that's so interesting is like when when we use our gifts, it actually results in our own fulfillment. I was thinking about this. Uh, yesterday, my brother-in-law came over and he helped install some recessed lights in my living room. And I like love like cool lights and stuff like that. Like I get way too excited about that. And so he helped install these and um, it's gonna be a blessing for years to come for my wife and I. But here's what I, what I think is really interesting. My brother-in-law actually finds fulfillment in being a blessing to Sarah and I. Like he gets to use his gifts to bless others. And he actually finds deep joy in that. That's why I think the Bible says it's better to give than to receive. And that's the surprise about when we, when we actually use our gifts, it actually encourages and uplifts ourselves, not just the receiver. It encourages us when we do that. And here's what I would say for you today. If you feel like your life is not having a life of meaning and of purpose, if you are feeling like, you know what? Most days my, my life feels kind of empty. I believe Jesus might be calling you to something today. I think he might be calling you to use your unique gifts to serve other people. I think that's what he is inviting each of us to today. But maybe you're sitting there and you're thinking, I actually don't know what my gifts are. 
And I want you to know, we've actually put together a short resource for you on our website at rcalvary.org slash gifts, where you can take a quick survey after church is over to be able to find out some of the ways that you are uniquely wired. And we'd even be glad to sit down for a conversation if you wanted to talk further about that. The second piece of answering the question, what do you have to give to help make the most of your life is your resources. And this is what's something that's always surprising me is that for me, if I'm being honest, it's always hard for me to like initially let go because I feel like inside, I'm like, well, I worked harder or my wife and I, we worked hard to earn this. Or it's like, I really want to make sure that this is going to be used exactly how I want it to be used. Sounds a little bit like the authority control thing we talked about earlier. And, but this is what surprises me is that when I actually give, I do find joy after I've taken the step and I've made the release. I believe that a generous heart is what leads to a joy-filled heart. And for me, I want to live a joy-filled life. I don't want to be running the rat race. I want to get off of the hamster wheel altogether. Like that's, that's not the race I'm running. I'm running a very different race. And I think Jesus is inviting each of us to that as well. There's a book called The Paradox of Generosity, and uh, it's written by authors Christian Smith and Hilary Davidson. They did some research out of Notre Dame, and uh, this is not like a Christian thing. These were secular researchers who talked to hundreds of different people to, to compile what is it that makes for a generous person? What are the attributes? All kinds of uh, questions they were asking and answering through some high-level academic studies. And the first thing they found is that generosity actually leads to a better life. And they said that more generous people are happier, there's fewer illnesses, they live with a greater sense of purpose, and they experience less depression. I, I was amazed by that. And they, they said that it wasn't just through like doing random acts of kindness, it was through consistent generosity in their lives. This is what they write. They said, generosity is paradoxical. In letting go of some of what we own, we better secure our own lives. By giving ourselves away, we ourselves move toward flourishing. This is not only a philosophical or a religious teaching, it is a sociological fact. Fascinating that this is what the world finds to be true, is actually that the teachings of Jesus are right and good. They go on to expand. They said, the generosity paradox can also be stated in the negative. In holding on to what we possess, we diminish its long-term value to us. By always protecting ourselves against future uncertainties and misfortunes, we are affected in ways that make us more anxious about uncertainties and vulnerable to future misfortunes. In short, by failing to care for others, we do not properly take care of ourselves. It is no coincidence that the word miser is etymologically related to the word miserable. In other words, there are real effects on your life when you are generous and when you are not. I find it fascinating that even other disciplines have proven this to be true. So our big question of the day, how do we live a life of meaning and of purpose? What do you have? What can you give? You have your gifts, you have your generosity, and third, you have your time. You can use your time to invest in relationships with other people. This is one of the things that I find interesting about using your time is sometimes when you start serving other people, <clears throat> You could even serve somebody who's very different than you, who thinks differently, who votes differently, who looks differently, who acts differently, who whatever. But when you are heading actually in the same mission and the same goal and the same vision, you actually start to develop a relationship with somebody. You get in proximity and you start to see, man, you know what? There are some things that we have in common. There are some ways that we can actually get along when we start serving. And when you start serving, you actually can develop unique friendships that you wouldn't have in any other place. That's one thing I love about the church, is it's so diverse and so different from ages, races, socioeconomic, socioeconomic backgrounds. It doesn't matter. It's, it's all different, but we're all going towards the same goal, to go and make disciples, 
to make much of Jesus. And so I, I just think, it, you know, the old quote is, it takes time to make an old friend. And I think sometimes for us, the step really is, we need to just sign up and start serving, using our gifts, using our time, using our minds to be able to be a blessing for other people. And so today, I wanna to get pragmatic with this, and I want to be able to give you a next step. And maybe your next step is that the Lord is just gonna bring people in front of you that he's inviting you to be able to serve. Or maybe it's that you are really passionate about a cause, and so you're to sign up with an organization. But we know that many of you have been asking the question, how could I get involved to use my gifts at Calvary? Or even if you haven't asked, asked that question, I want to invite you to consider that today because I believe that the mission of our church, a safe place to find faith, friends, and your future is an important one and that you can actually be a part of helping transform other people's lives through the power of God working through you. And there's a whole variety of ways for you to be able to use your gifts. And so what we did is we put together what we've called a serve guide. And in this guide that is underneath your seats, um, you, there is a whole plethora of options for you to be able to use your gifts. And there's also a sign-up card for you to be able to use as well. If you're joining us online, there's a place we've put on our website for you to be able to learn about your gifts at rcalvary.org serve. And really, the, the point of this isn't because we need to get something from you. The point is we want to give you an opportunity to be able to use your unique gifts to serve the Lord. There's, there's three things for us as a church that we are strategically focused on right now in this season. And I wanna go over those things with you for just a moment. The first is this, we are strategically focused on our kids' ministry, our children's ministry. Right now, many of you know that we're meeting on the first and third Sunday of every single month, but what we would love to be able to do is to provide children's ministry every single Sunday. And the way that we're able to do that is if we have more people who are investing in our children. And as valuable as this and amazing as this new facility is, it doesn't compare one iota to the treasure that is our children. And so for us, we wanted to give an invitation to you to consider serving in our children's ministry. You don't have to be a certified teacher in order to invest in the next generation. And here's what's so great about it is when you make an investment in the kids, you get to help raise up and train up their lives and their future, but you also make space in a way for parents to be able to grow and come back and engage with God, to be able to get back into the rhythm of life in the church. The second invitation strategically that we are focused on is our live stream. We've been able to see incredible fruit throughout this time in, in being able to amplify the gospel outside of this room. And so for us, we've got big dreams for what we want to be able to do to help impact our city and our nation and our globe. And simply, we are inviting people to consider that they would be able to join our camera team. You don't have to be super techie. You don't have to be young. Any of those things, we will teach you. We will train you. If you're somebody who likes to work behind the scenes, that might be the opportunity for you. And the third strategic focus for us is in our outreach team. And this is a team that doesn't like benefit us necessarily here in this room. It really is a team about going out and serving. No strings attached. We're not trying to get anything from anybody else. We're simply trying to live out exactly what Jesus has said here. And so our outreach team sends out an email and says, here's an opportunity. Are you available? Would you like to serve? And so I want you to hear this though. There's a whole variety of serves in that serve guide. And after church, I would encourage you to take a look at it to be able to figure that out. And there's a serve card as well to be able to sign up. And it's not a commitment. It's just for you to be able to pursue more information. But I, I don't want us to miss through the details what I, what I believe God is actually calling us to. I do, do believe he calls us to serve in our local church, but I think he's calling us to a lot more than just serving from 8.45 to 10.15 on a Sunday morning. I think he's inviting our lives to be a life of service, 
to be people who are focused on raising up, training up others to be able to do the work of the ministry. So I actually wanna invite you to bow your heads and to close your eyes for just a moment, to be able to take a, a second to reflect. Because the truth is for you and I, it's not even just that we are broad sinners, like we've messed up, we all recognize that. But honestly, even in all of the three cultural answers, we've probably fallen short in our lives. We've used our authority for our own gain instead of somebody else's. We've used our wealth for selfish purposes, or we've used what we have to try to get people to love us or to try to have them be impressed by us. We're broken. Our motives aren't always pure. But I believe that Jesus is still clearly calling us to live a life of service, even though he knows we can't measure up. But this is what's so beautiful about what Jesus did. This is why he came back for us 2,000 years ago. He knew that the weight of not being able to measure up would be so crushing on our shoulders that he went to the cross in our place. This is why Jesus says, I have used my life as an opportunity to serve, to serve as your ransom. He made a path and he made a way when there was no other way. Jesus is the ultimate servant and Jesus is our model for how we can live a life of meaning and of purpose. He's inviting you to a kingdom life, to a full life, one that views our whole life as submitted to him. A rooted life is a life of service. So let me just give you a moment to reflect, to think about your own mindset of your gifts, your resources, and your time. Where in your life do you notice you are trying to get? And where in your life do you notice God is calling you to serve? I'll give you a moment with the Lord. So this morning, Lord, just like you surrendered your life for ours, we come with open hands to you, to be people who live like you, lives who are servants to others, that we recognize that the greatest is actually the least. Jesus, we know we can't do this on our own. So Lord, I pray that you would solidify these things in our hearts, that you would open up opportunities for us to be able to serve others. And then Lord, would you help us to make the time and space to be able to follow through on that? We trust in you, Jesus. We come with open hands because of what you have already done for us. You have loved us so deeply. This is simply our response back to a loving savior. Would you help us to live how your kingdom values lives of service? In Jesus' name, amen.